Welcome everyone uh, for today's talk. Uh, today uh, we'll have uh, Josh uh, Alman. Uh, before we get there, let me start by uh, thanking all the other organizers here in TCS Plus. So it's um, uh, Clement Canon who's here helping me with the operation. Also, Anindia Day is also here. Hi, Anindia. Uh, and also behind the scenes, we have uh, G. Kamat. Uh, we have uh, Thomas Vidik, and uh, a new addition to our team is uh, Ilya Rasenstein. Uh, so, uh, again, I remind everyone. Uh, to uh, uh, try to ask questions uh, during the talk. And before before we get there, let me quickly, uh, let's quickly go around the table to so, uh, see who is uh, joining us today. So, uh, Clement, do you, do you want to take over? Uh, yeah, so we've got uh, Anin Yade uh, uh, from Pakistan. We've got Jiabeng uh, Zheng from UCSD. Uh, we've got um, Kya Gopalakrishnan from the East Carolina University, and uh, Madhav uh, Suresh from Northwestern University. Um, Sayedesan, sorry if I uh, pronounce it badly. Uh, uh, we've got uh, Shina uh, Shian from University of Madison, um, Sorachai from uh, the Michigan State University, uh, Srinivasan from um, uh, CWI in Amsterdam, and uh, Thomas Vedic from Caltech. Oh, and just oh. somebody that just arrived, uh, Dimitri Sotara from the University of Wisconsin. Great, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Clemo, if you can just, yeah, back to me, good. Um, Okay, so again, um, today's talk is by uh, um, Josh uh, Alman. Um, and um, let me, uh, oh, before I forget to remind you, uh, the, we're not sure yet if we'll, we'll have a TCS Plus talk in two weeks, but uh, after that, we do have two speakers lined up. Um, and it's going to be uh, Santosh Vempala and uh, Kasper Green Larson. Um, so, uh, again, back to Josh Alman. We'll be talking today about uh, probabilistic rank and uh, matrix rigidity. Um, Josh uh, was a math, math major at um, MIT, uh, and then he decided to um, try uh, the West Coast for a nicer weather, and he moved to Sanford uh, and, um, with a uh, PhD student in Sanford, uh, advised by Ryan Williams and Virginia Vasilevska Williams. Uh, alas, he had to move back to the East Coast, and I was back at MIT with Ryan and Virginia, uh, completing his uh, PhD there. Um, so I guess today he'll be telling us about his um, stock uh, 17 paper, um, I believe. Uh, and it looks like we have some nice figures there. So uh, please, and again, uh, questions are most welcome. Um, and Josh, uh, please go ahead. Hi. Well, thanks for the introduction. and. Uh... I just want to say thanks to all the TCS Plus organizers for organizing this talk. And well, I know I've gotten a lot out of watching TCS Plus videos online. So really, thank you very much for organizing the whole the whole series. Um, so just today, give it to me. <laughs> um, I just want to make sure everyone can see your slides. Oh, yeah. uh, let's try that. That should be fine in a minute. Can want you can add the presenter mode on Josh. Oh. Okay. I hope it's fine now. So let's go on, and I'll let you know if not. OK. Um, yeah, so today I want to tell you about probabilistic rank and matrix rigidity. And this is joint work with, with Ryan Williams. So uh, oh. OK, so let me get, tell you the plan for, for my talk. So I'm first going to tell you about matrix rigidity and how it's related to arithmetic circuits and why people first started caring about matrix rigidity. Uh, and then after that, I'll present our main result, which is a rigidity upper bound for the walsh hadamard transform. So I'll, I'll tell you what that means in a moment. Um, then afterwards, I want to tell you about two different sort of variants on matrix rigidity that 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 we've proved some interesting things, I think, about. Uh, the first is probabilistic rank. And I'll tell you about probabilistic rank and what it has to do with some, some recent cool algorithmic techniques. Uh, and and how it's how it's related to rigidity, 
And then I'll talk about another variant called sign rank rigidity if I have time at the end and how it relates to threshold circuits. All right, so let's get started with, you know, what is matrix rigidity? So uh, a matrix is called rigid loosely if it has high rank and you need to change a lot of entries in the matrix before it drops to low rank. Uh, so to be more precise, uh, say over a ring R, we'll say the rank R rigidity of a matrix, A, which we'll denote by this squiggly R sub A of the rank, is the minimum number of entries of A that you need to modify in order to drop the rank of the matrix to R. Uh, so as an example, if I is the, the D by D identity matrix, then its rank R rigidity is D minus R, since, well, it starts with rank D, but each time you just change one diagonal entry to a zero, it decreases the rank by one. So to get the rank to R, you only need to change D minus R entries. So the identity matrix, even though it's high rank, it's not a very rigid matrix. Uh, so matrix rigidity is, is, was really introduced in the context of arithmetic circuits. So let me first tell you what a linear circuit is. A linear circuit, it's a circuit co for computing a linear transformation. So there's, it's for computing some transformation A, which is a matrix. Uh, and it's a circuit such that the inputs are the entries of a vector X, and its outputs are the entries of the vector Y, such that Y is equal to A times the vector X. And then each gate is computes a linear transformation of two inputs, a linear combination of its two inputs. Uh, so the, the two important measures are the size of the circuit is the number of gates in the circuit, and the depth is the length of the longest path from one of the inputs x to one of the outputs y. Uh, so what's what's neat is you might have heard of like arithmetic circuits, which are circuits that look kind of like this. And like you, in addition to gates that have compute linear combinations of the two inputs, you can also have gates that like multiply and things like that. But uh, you can show that at the expense of just some constant factors, you can assume any arithmetic circuit that computes a linear transformation is actually a linear circuit. So, so we're really interested in linear circuits for computing error, uh, for computing linear transformations. All right. So, what what kinds of what kinds of linear circuits exist for linear transformations? Well, first you can check any D by D matrix has a depth log D and size D squared linear circuit. Right, because just for each of the y, each of the y outputs, you can have a circuit of size d and depth log d that just computes any linear transformation of the inputs and and computes the correct one for that y entry. But you can often do a lot better. So, for instance, uh, if you if if you know like the cooley tukey algorithm, say for computing the fast Fourier transform, you've probably seen this this like butterfly graph for. Uh, but but this this graph actually is a actually corresponds to a linear circuit a linear circuit for computing the fast Fourier transform if you, if you've seen how the algorithm works so for for a lot of for a lot of matrices of interest like the discrete Fourier transform you actually can get circuits of depth log d but size just say d log d instead of d squared so a big question since there are a lot of matrices like the fast Fourier transform that are really important for computing in practice or in theory is uh, how can we show lower bounds on the size and depth of these kinds of circuits? So I guess I think one of the biggest goals in this area is to prove that an explicit matrix doesn't have arithmetic circuits of linear size and log depth. Like if we could do it for say the fast Fourier transform, that would be really, that would be really impressive. But really, just proving it for any explicit matrix would be a would be a big deal in this area. Uh, and how is this related to matrix rigidity? Well, uh, in in the seventies, Leslie Valiant showed a, a big connection between rigidity and arithmetic circuits. What he showed is that if there's a if a family of matrices is, is sufficiently rigid, then it can't have log depth linear size circuits. So in particular. If there's some constant delta, so that uh, by changing d the dimension to the power of one plus delta entries, you can't get the rank to drop below d over log log d, just like a little bit less than linear. If if you can find a family of matrices with this rigidity property, then that means that 
that that family of matrices can't be computed by linear size log depth circuits. So I guess the, the updated goal from the last slide is we just need to find some explicit rigid matrices. And that'll mean that those, those corresponding transformations can't be computed by small arithmetic circuits. OK, so I've said, I said the word explicit a few times on this side in the last. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, basically, what I mean is that each entry can compute, be computed in polynomial time in the, in the dimension of the matrices. And this is important because there actually are known rigid matrices and known like functions which require big arithmetic circuits, which are not explicit. So uh, one example, if you just take a random matrix, it's not too hard to show that it's rigid with high probability. And in fact, Goldreich and Tall showed recently that a random toplets matrix is also rigid with high probability. So like a random matrix, you would need to pick D squared random entries, but for a random toplets matrix is, is determined by only D random entries. Uh, you can also get matrices which have, you know, really nice closed form expressions, which are rigid, but whose entries are really, really large, like require, they require exponential size just to write down the entries of the matrix. And you can show such things are, are rigid also, but they don't count as explicit for us because you can't even write down the entries in polynomial in D time. All right. Josh? So, yeah. Uh, just two minor things. Uh, first, when you say family, you actually mean just one matrix per D, right? It's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so for or information to be matrix. Or even a sequence for, for some Ds, like an infinite sequence that okay. yeah. some You'll need it for all these, sure. Uh, and, and the second thing, uh, when you say we know examples, so those examples, they're not explicit, but they still give lower bound, just lower bound for uh, not very explicit uh, function, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they, they still give the, the lower bound. Like these, these things all don't have small arithmetic circuits. That's right. Uh, OK, so let me tell you about uh, the, the family of matrices I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about in this talk. It's called the Walsh-Hadamard transform. It's, it's a transform very similar to the fast, like the discrete Fourier transform. You, you might have seen it before. So it's given by you know, the, first, the first matrix is this 1, 1, 1, minus 1 matrix. And then they're given by this, re this recurrence that the nth one is equal to like four copies of the n minus one one, but the one in the bottom right corner is is negative. So the the nth Walsh Hadamard transform is a two to the n by two to the n matrix. Uh, and we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot about the rigidity and other properties of these Walsh Hadamard transforms. Uh, so let me actually give one alternate definition of them, which will be useful in some of our proofs later. So uh, just some notation for d. Uh, length d vectors x and y, we'll use these, these angle brackets to denote their inner product, like their dot product. Then uh, what we'll do is, let's say we have the, the 2 to the n different ve 0, 1 vectors of length n. So we're going we're gonna to index the rows and columns of hn with the 0, 1 vectors of length n. Then the walsh hadamard matrix is alternatively defined as being the entry corresponding to vi and vj is well, minus 1 to the power of the inner product. So it, sort of the parity of the inner product of vi and vj. This, this other definition is going to be useful in some of our proofs later. All right, so well, what's, what's interesting about the Walsh-Hadamard matrix and rigidity? Uh, so there's, there's just this definition again. Uh, so it's, Hn has a, been one of the most commonly studied matrices that people believed you could show a lower bound, uh, uh, arithmetic circuit lower bound using rigidity. And there's a, there's a whole long line of work where people show partial rigidity results towards proving that it's actually a rigid, a rigid family of matrices. And I guess our, uh, our main result sort of helps to explain why these are all partial results, I guess, because uh, we, we show that actually the Walsh had of our matrices are not that rigid. We show that uh, for any, for sufficiently small epsilons, if you're able to change d to the power of one plus epsilon entries of, of the walsh hadamard matrix, then you can get the, the rank of the matrix to drop all the way to d to the one minus f of epsilon, which is about epsilon squared. So in other words, for any for sufficiently small constant epsilons, if you're allowed to change d to the one plus epsilon entries, 
you can get the rate to drop all the way to d to the power of some, some constant that's less than 1. And this shows that uh, the, the Hadamard matrices are not rigid enough for, for valiance program. They're not rigid enough to plug into the theorem from the last slide and show that they don't have small arithmetic circuits. Because for that, we would have needed that for some epsilon, uh, by changing d to the 1 plus epsilon entries, it's impossible to get the rank to drop below just d over log log d. We can show no for any epsilon, we can actually get it all the way to the to d to the one minus f of epsilon. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna actually our proof of this is is not so complicated, and I I am gonna be able to present the whole thing. But before I get into that, uh, are there any questions about the setup so far? Yeah, I've got one question. What was the original motivation to like believe that these matrices were rigid? Like, why in '88 people did believe? this was a good candidate. Yeah, well, I, I think, I mean, I guess similar to the fast Fourier transform matrix, uh, like there's a size d log d arithmetic circuit for these. And I guess in general, people thought that the like matrix rigidity is a good, good approach toward proving that uh, matrices don't have linear size arithmetic circuits. So it seemed like a good approach to proving no, we can't we can't actually make smaller circuits than we're able to. Yeah, I think it's it's just people thought maybe it would be a good approach to showing it doesn't have smaller circuits. Uh, another question. It's um, uh, so what, what do you get? You know, so if you take the um, Walsh Hadamard, which is essentially some kind of uh, it, it is a Fourier transform over um uh z2 right but yeah. well, what happens if you get um if you take rank over f2 over the field with two elements oh yeah yeah so over f2 right just the walsh hadamard transform has has really small rank it, like not even rigidity but just rank like log d so uh it's true that yeah over f2 it has very small rank but for the but the the valiant program the rigidity program which show that over every field the the matrix uh, wait, or the the it requires the matrix just to be rigid over some field, sorry. And so by showing that it's not rigid over every field, you get this contradiction. And I assume most previous work thought of uh, rank over the over the reals, right? Yeah, yeah, typically, or or bigger finite fields than F two. Yeah, fields with characteristic bigger than two. It's still interesting. So another question, maybe uh, you might, uh, you, maybe you were planning to address. Anyway, uh, does your result say anything about circuits for Walsh oh, Hadamard? Yeah, so it, so it, that's right. It doesn't. It doesn't. This doesn't rule out the possibility of there being or not being a linear size log depth circuit for Walsh Hadamard transform. Right. It does. It does give some kind of upper bound. Like you can say, like there's a arithmetic circuit of unbounded fanin fan -in with depth like constant depth like depth 2 and size like sublinear in like truly sublinear in d like there you get some upper bounds with, from this but not not really the kinds of upper or lower bounds that people in this area are interested in i guess and just again to uh, emphasize this, so uh, because this is some kind of discrete fourier transform you have a circuit like the fast fourier transform right yeah. Yeah. There's a circuit that looks just like the one I showed before, which competes these kinds of these matrices also. Okay. And, and the reason this is not an issue? Uh yeah, so that 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 circuit has size d log d and depth d. And we're the if it were rigid, they would rule out a size size linear in d circuit. So that that's 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 bigger than the size of, of circuits that rigid matrices would rule out. I see. So, so currently, they're saying that the whole issue is like whether it's D or can you we get beyond linear, which is a, like a big open question, right? You ideally yeah. like to show D log D. Good. Got you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Like it'd, it'd be great to show if some, some function requires D log D, but even just showing it can't be computed in, in D is, is we don't know how to do that yet. So that's where we're at now. OK. Uh, so let me let me get into the, the proof of this non-rigidity this non-rigidity theorem. And I first want to present uh, an important connection between, uh, I guess, sparse polynomials, low sparsity polynomials, and low rank matrices, which is going to be important in a lot of 
in a lot of our results. So, so here's the idea. Let's say f is uh, any Boolean function that it, it's a function defined on 0, 1 vectors of length, say, 2n. Uh, then we'll say its truth table matrix, m sub f, is, is the 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix such that the, the x comma y entry is f evaluated at x comma y. So for instance, we just talked about before how the Hadamard, the Walsh Hadamard transform is the truth table matrix of the inner product mod two function, which is minus one to the power of the inner product of x and y. All right, then, uh, so suppose we had a polynomial p on the two n variables, a multivariate polynomial, which computes the function. So what I mean by that is, well, let me give an example. For the AND function, the AND on the two n variables, we can look at this, this polynomial p, which is just a single monomial that's the product of all the variables. And this computes the AND function, because if you plug in all ones for the variables, then this is equal to 1. But if any one of the entries is 0, then this is entry equal to 0. So p of x, y is equal to the AND of x and y. Then uh, the connection is that if, if the function is computed by this polynomial p, and p has m monomials, then the rank of the truth table matrix of the function is at most m. So the rank of the truth table matrix is at most the number of monomials for the polynomial that, that computes the function. All right, so why is this? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, for instance, uh, since we have a polynomial with one monomial for and, that means the rank of the and truth table has rank at most one. And it's not so hard. It's the matrix that's like all zeros except for one one in it. So of course it has rank one. Okay, so let me let me let me prove this. And it's actually quite simple. So the idea is you take your polynomial and you write it out as a sum of its m monomials. Like here's an example. Then what we're gonna do is split each monomial up into its x part and its y part. So we can rewrite P as this inner product of two vectors, where in the first vector in the ith component, we have the x part of the ith monomial. And the second vector in the ith component, we have the y part of the ith monomial. So you can see when we construct these two vectors and take their, their dot product the, or their inner product, the result will be evaluating the polynomial. So the polynomial and hence our, our Boolean function can be written as this inner product of a x vector of length m and a like vector depending on only y's of length m. So then uh, if you make the whole matrix of all the x vectors over all the two to the n different evaluations and the matrix of all the y vectors over all the two to the n different evaluations, then the, the product of these two matrices, uh, maybe like the, trans, the transpose of one of them, will give the truth table matrix of the function. And so since the, the inner dimension is going to be the length of these vectors, which is m, that shows that the truth table matrix has rank m. So this, this like trick for evaluating polynomials in terms of these inner products show that if some uh, function has a low sparsity, low number of monomials polynomial, then it has a low rank matrix also. All right. So with this connection in mind, let's, let's talk about uh, the proof of the, the upper bound. So um so here's here's just a restatement i just made it a little bit simpler first of all there was like this f of epsilon going on i've just replaced it with there's an epsilon greater than zero so uh what we're going to show is that for every epsilon greater than zero there's an epsilon prime greater than zero so that the hadamard matrix differs in at most two to the n times one plus epsilon entries from a matrix whose rank is at most two to the n times one minus epsilon prime uh, and the other thing is, well, I said our theorem holds over over any field, over any ring even. Uh, I'm just going to prove it over R for now. And the, the proof over any field is almost exactly the same, but there's one technical detail that's not so interesting that comes up in the middle over fields of finite characteristic. So I'm just going to uh, ignore that for now by proving it over reals. But really, almost the exact same proof will work over any field too. So uh, and just as a reminder, the Hadamard matrix is the truth table matrix of the inner product mod two function. So the x, y entry is given by minus one to the power of the inner product of x and y. OK, so let me tell you that the outline for the proof is going to go in sort of three steps. So we're first going to construct a polynomial 
not a polynomial that computes the inner product mod 2 on every point, but one that computes it on, I'll, we'll see a lot of different points. Uh, so we'll, we'll take this polynomial and make like the truth table matrix corresponding to this polynomial. And what we'll see is that our polynomial is going to compute the inner product mod 2 correctly on x's and y's for which the inner product of x and y lies in a, a particular interval that we're going to pick. So we'll have a polynomial that works for the x's and y's where their inner product lies in a particular interval. And then well, the errors will be like the, the, the x's and y's where the inner product's not in that interval. And we'll see there's a lot of x's and y's where the inner product is basically never in that interval, or it's very rarely in that interval. And in the last step, we're going to have this nice row and column correction trick to correct a bunch of those x's and y's so that in the end, every row x and every column y has either been corrected or it has the property that the inner product is almost always in the, our interval that we chose. All right, so let me let me get started with, with step one. Let me tell you the, the polynomial we're going to construct. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to use one ingredient. We're going to use a univariate polynomial p from the rest of the reals, such that for integer z in this interval, this is the interval I was talking to you about before, and I'll tell you why we chose this particular one in a moment. For integer z between 2 times epsilon times n and half plus epsilon times n, we have that p of z correctly computes the parity of z. So p of z is 1 if z is even, and p of z is minus 1 if z is odd. All right, then, uh, so by polynomial interpolation, since we've, we've defined p's values on half minus epsilon times n different points, uh, p can have degree half minus epsilon times n, so a little bit less than half n. Uh, so what we'll do, our multivariate polynomial is going to be the polynomial Q, where you just plug the inner product of x and y into the, this polynomial P. So that means that Q of x and y com correctly computes the inner product, the inner product mod 2 of x and y, whenever, whenever the inner product of x and y is in this interval we picked here. So whenever x, the inner product is in that interval, we, we evaluate p at that inner product, and so it correctly computes the, the parity of that inner product. Uh, so the question is, right, how many monomials does, does q have? Because that will bound what the rank of the truth table matrix is. So like, I guess an, an important thing about polynomials for Boolean functions is that we can always assume they're multilinear. We can always assume that we don't take any variable to a power greater than 1. Because you know if x sub i is just either 0 or 1, then x sub i equals x sub i squared. So if we ever had an x sub i squared someplace, we could replace it with x sub i, and it wouldn't change the value on any of the on any of the points we're interested in. So we can assume that Q is a multilinear polynomial, and that means the number of monomials is just at most the number of monomials of degree at most half minus epsilon times n, which is this binomial sum here. So uh, with a with a standard tail bound. You can see that this binomial sum, the sum of to half minus epsilon n of n choose i, is at most 2 to the n times 1 minus epsilon prime for some epsilon prime that's about epsilon squared. And this, this is really, this is the standard like turn off bound applied to uh, like a binomial variable because the binomial distribution, because really this is computing if we you know, flip n coins, what's the probability that the total number of heads is less than half minus epsilon times n? So by the standard tail bounds, uh, we get that it's less than 2 to the n times 1 minus epsilon prime for some epsilon prime. OK, so in other words, the rank of the truth tail matrix of Q is 2 to the n times 1 minus epsilon prime. All right, so now we have to think more carefully about this, this interval we picked. and what I'm going to claim is that if x and y are two vectors, 0, 1 vectors, which have ones in about half of their entries and zeros in about half of their entries, then well, most likely their inner product is in the range of the interval of this interval. So to be more precise, let's say let's let E be the set of you know, 0, 1 vectors of length n such that the number of ones is between half minus epsilon n and half plus epsilon n. So they have about half ones and half zeros. Then, well, first of all, you can check that if x is in this set E and you pick any y vector at all of length n, 
then the inner product of x and y is at most half plus epsilon n. That's just because x has at most that many ones. So its inner product with another zero one vector can be at most half plus epsilon times n. So in other words, if x is in the set E and its inner product is not in this range, it has to be less than two times epsilon times n. It has to be below the range because it's always at most at the upper limit of the range. Uh, but you can check you know, if you have one x vector in E and you pick a random y vector from E as well, then the inner product is about n over 4. Like each entry has a 1 quarter chance of contributing 1 to the inner product. So the probability that if you has have a fixed x and you pick a random y, that it's the inner product is less than 2 times epsilon times n is, is really, really low. And actually, with a, with a standard tail bound, you can show that the probability is less than 2 to the minus 1 minus epsilon times n. Uh, so in other words, for every x vector in the set E, the number of y vectors in the set E, such that this, the inner product is not in this interval we picked, is at most 2 to the power of epsilon times n. So uh, to summarize what we have so far, we have this matrix m sub p that comes, oh, sorry, I think this should be q, actually. m sub q that comes from the polynomial q we defined on the last slide. It has rank 2 to the n times 1 minus epsilon prime. and among the entries corresponding to x and y that are both in our set E, it correctly computes the, Hadam, the corresponding Hadamard matrix entry on all but 2 to the n times 1 plus epsilon of them. So if we only cared about those x and y which are in the set E, this would be what we wanted to prove already. We would be done. But the problem is there's there's some that are not in the set E that we'll have to deal with. Josh? Yeah. Uh just um, slow down a bit. So why, why do you restrict y to be in E in the tail bound? What happens if you take um, all uh, the lines? Uh, yeah, it might. Mm. So it the might problem is, yeah. if, for instance, if like all the y's, it, it might still, I think, I think instead of an epsilon, so for, it's, it's true that the probability over a random y also, the expected value is also n over 4. But we, we want to use the fact that uh, y has about half ones and half zeros also to show, to show that the probability that it's less than 2 times epsilon times n is even lower. Like, I think if we, if, the, if we were drawing over a random y, then we could only say an epsilon prime here instead of an epsilon uh, by basically the same tail, kind of tail bound we were talking about before. Right, like epsilon log one over epsilon, right? This yeah. Be yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you saying that would be not good enough? Uh, I think so. I think it. I think that would be less than epsilon. Uh, I mean, okay. The I guess. I guess. I think. I think it might work out, but I guess we're we're gonna see on the next slide that we can deal with x's and y's that are not in the set E in a different okay. way anyway. So it won't okay. matter too much, I guess. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so how are we going to deal with those x's and y's? So here's remember here's the definition of e again. Uh, so what we're going to do we're going to do this like very simple trick, which is that if you have a matrix, then it has rank r, then you can pick any say any row of the matrix you want, and change it arbitrarily to any other values you want. So if you have a you have a rank r matrix, you pick one row and change all the entries in that row to whatever you want them to be then doing this operation can only have increased the rank of the matrix by one. Because you can, you can always do a, a one row update to a matrix by changing the rank of the matrix by only one. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this kind, of, this kind of update. We're going to correct every single x vector, the row corresponding to every single x vector that's not in our set E, and just pick that row and change it to what it's supposed to be to compute the Hadamard matrix, increasing the rank of the matrix only by one each time. And similarly, for each y that's not in our set E, we're going to correct the row corresponding to y, increasing the rank by only one. And why is this OK? Well, the rank is going to increase by the number of such x's and y's which are not in the set E. But again, how many is that? Well, it's just the sum over, well, the number of ones is between 0 and half minus epsilon n, or two times that for the ones above, above the interval of n choose i. 
the 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 or the size of the number of vectors that are not in E is bounded by like this exact same binomial sum as we had before. So again, by doing this correction, the rank only increases by uh, two to the n times one minus epsilon prime amount again. So we can, in other words, we can fix all of those x's and y's that are not in the set E, and the total rank of the matrix is still two to the n times one minus epsilon prime, like maybe times times like five or something like that. So that's so that's actually the whole proof. Just to summarize, uh, we constructed this matrix M p prime, which is we got from the polynomial p, and then we corrected the vectors x and y, which are not in the set E. Its rank is two to the n times one minus epsilon prime, because that was the number of monomials in the polynomial, and that's also the number of rows and columns which we had to correct. And if either x or y is not in the set E, then we know it's that entry is equal to the Hadamard matrix at, at entry because we explicitly corrected that row or column. And if both x and y are in the set E, then it's equal to the Hadamard matrix for all but two to the one plus epsilon times n choices because of how we chose the polynomial, because it would only not work if the inner product happened to be very, very small compared to what it should be. And so this construction shows just what we wanted, that there's a there's a rank two to the n times one minus epsilon prime matrix that differs from the Hadamard our matrix in at most two to the n times one plus epsilon entries. All right, so uh, yeah, before I move on, are there any questions about the proof or questions about Yes, uh, so, so when you interpolate P, don't you assume that uh, the field is like large enough for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the interpolation, how I told you about it, only works over, say, the real or a field of infinite characteristic. Uh, you can actually, it turns out the polynomial you want exists over any field. It's just a little bit more work to, to prove that it exists. And you can somewhat efficiently find it, right? Yeah, you can. You can. It's like explicitly defined as some, some like some binomial coefficients or something like this. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so in that case, I want to talk. I'm going to move on now that we're like half an hour into the talk. I want to move on to tell you about the other word in the title of my talk, which is uh, probabilistic rank. So this will be interesting, I guess. What's well, interesting to me because probabilistic rank is really, I think, why Ryan and I started thinking about these rigidity problems in the first place. Uh, so what is probabilistic rank? Well, a probabilistic matrix is just instead of being a single matrix, it's now a distribution on matrices. So it's it's a distribution on a bunch of d by d matrices over some ring R. Uh, and then we'll say that a probabilistic matrix computes a fixed matrix A if, with error some epsilon, if for each of the entries in A, the probability over drawing a matrix, a fixed matrix B from our probabilistic matrix that the, the matrix we drew has the correct value as the same value as A on that entry, uh, the probability of this is at least one minus epsilon. So in other words, a probabilistic matrix is a worst case randomized representation of the fixed matrix A. For any of the entries of A, if you draw a matrix B from the probabilistic matrix, then B has the correct value on that entry with error only epsilon. Uh, and the reason this is interesting is because you can frequently get a probabilistic ma matrix. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. We'll say the, the rank of the probabilistic matrix is just the maximum rank of any matrix in the support of the probabilistic matrix. Okay, so this is interesting because you can frequently get a matrix which whose rank is much lower than the matrix A. So by, by allowing some errors, you're by allowing some randomized errors throughout the matrix, you can you can get the rank to drop to be much lower. So for instance, the identity matrix, which has rank, the D by D identity matrix has rank D, it actually has a probabilistic matrix of rank just order one over epsilon for any error epsilon. So if you want you know, a probabilistic matrix with constant error, you can get a distribution on just constant rank matrices that probabilistically approximate the identity matrix this way. And I'll, I'll probably even present the proof of this in a few slides. Uh, so, our, so what's the relation between probabilistic rank and matrix rigidity? 
well, kind of probabilistic rank is a is a more average case version of 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 rigidity. So you can see if you have a probabilistic rank expression for a matrix, then by drawing a typical matrix from that expression, you get a rigidity upper bound as well. Like if you had a probabilistic matrix of rank R and error epsilon, then the rank R rigidity of the matrix is the most epsilon times D squared by just drawing a matrix from the distribution. But what's, what's more surprising that we show is that the converse is also true in some cases. For instance, for the Hadamard matrix, matrix HN, we show that there exists a probabilistic matrix of rank R and error epsilon if and only if the, the rigidity of the Hadamard matrix with rank R is at most epsilon times D squared. Uh, so, and and this, this equivalence isn't just for the Hadamard matrix, it also generalizes to a bunch of different randomly self-reducible functions that are random, like self-reducible in some, some randomized sense. Uh, so why is this interesting? Well, first of all, I guess the, the probabilistic rank of a matrix feels like sort of an average case notion and the rigidity is more of a worst case notion. So it seems easier to prove lower bounds on probabilistic rank compared to proving lower bounds on rigidity. Like for probabilistic rank, we have to rule out a distribution that sort of spreads out the errors all over the place. Whereas with rigidity, we have to rule out any, any setting of errors, even if the errors are sort of all concentrated on one hard to deal with location. So this equivalence gives a conceptually at least easier way to prove, try to prove rigidity lower bounds. So I think, I think it's interesting in that sense. But it's, probabilistic rank actually also comes up in a few other areas of computer science. So it, it arises very naturally in the study of certain communication complexity models. And there's a, a big line of work that discusses its relation to the, the polynomial hierarchy and communication complexity and some things like this. And I don't think I really have much time to talk about it, but if you read the intro of our paper and some of these references, you can read more about it if you're interested. Uh, but I think my favorite connection is, is that probabilistic rank is very related to some recent, what are called polynomial method algorithms. So let me tell you about this very quickly. Uh, these, these, are, these are some algorithms that have come up in, in some recent work where the idea is that you take some algorithms problem that you want to solve, like for instance, the orthogonal vectors problem or SAT or the all pair shortest path problem. And you, you interpret the algorithms problem as the problem of evaluating some type of circuit. So like for, for uh, all pair shortest path, it's a circuit that computes the whether whether one path is shorter than another path, say. And then what you do is you convert that circuit into a sparse probabilistic polynomial. And this a probabilistic polynomial is just like a probabilistic matrix. It's a it's a distribution on probable polynomials, which has like on any input is likely to give the correct answer. And then because of the connection between sparse polynomials and low rank matrices, that, that gives a corresponding small probabilistic rank expression for the circuit that we want to evaluate. And so using fast matrix multiplication, we can evaluate that low probabilistic rank expression and get an approximation to the actual truth table matrix we're trying to compute. Uh, so this, this, this like very broad technique has been useful to designing fast algorithms for a whole bunch of problems recently, like all pair shortest paths, constraint satisfaction problems, closest pair problems, stable matching problems. But I think it's really neat because what all these algorithms do is they basically use the fact that a, a some kind of circuit or some kind of function has low probabilistic rank to imply algorithmic results, which are which are very interesting. So uh, just as an example, this Abood, Williams, and you paper in SOTA 15 use a low rank expression for the and of or for an and of or circuit to solve the orthogonal vectors problem with the, the fastest known algorithm for that problem. And in fact, they, they show that if you can improve the probabilistic rank of this circuit a little bit, then that would refute the strong exponential time hypothesis because it would solve the orthogonal vectors problem, which is known to be hard for the strong exponential time hypothesis. Uh, and I put a star here because technically, if you find show that there's a probabilistic rank expression, that would only uh, refute some non-uniform version of the strong exponential time hypothesis, but most likely, if you're if you're, well, there's some details. Most likely, would actually refute this the real strong exponential time hypothesis also. But 
Uh, so yeah, sorry if I used some words which I didn't define here. But I think the, the big idea is that there's a whole bunch of, of papers which show that high, better probabilistic rank upper bounds would actually imply just faster algorithms for algorithmic problems that people really care about, like the all pair shortest paths problem. And I think this, this connection is really cool. And this, this is why Ryan and I started thinking about these things in the first place. Uh, OK, so with that in mind, uh, are there any questions about this, I guess? <laughs> All right, so let me then uh, go on to prove this equivalence between rigidity and probabilistic rank for the Hadamard matrix, like I told you about. So uh, the, the, again, the only if direction is pretty easy, because uh, given the probabilistic matrix, you just draw a random example from it, a typical example from it, and that has to give a rigidity upper bound as well. So what we need to prove is that the if direction. So in other words, we're given a rigidity, low, a rigidity upper bound expression for the Hadamard matrix. We're given a matrix C of rank R, which differs from the Hadamard matrix at the most epsilon fraction of the entries. And what we want is an epsilon probabilistic rank R expression for the Hadamard matrix. So we want to wait. We have like one one matrix of low rank where the entry errors are in a certain places, and we want a distribution with the same rank that will spread the errors out all over the place. Uh, so the the main idea is that we're gonna our distribution is going to pick some uniformly random zero one vectors of length n a and b, and we're gonna construct a new matrix C prime so that C prime will give the correct answer on any entry x comma y whenever C gave the correct answer on the entry x, x or a, comma, y, x or b. Because uh, for a fixed x and y, x, x or a, and y, x or b is a uniformly random entry of the original matrix C, if we have this property, it'll show that we have our, our probabilistic rank worst case error property that, that we need. So it suffices to show that if we, for any A and B, we can construct this matrix C prime, which has the same rank as C and has this property that it's correct on X and Y whenever C was correct on X, X or A, Y, X or B. Uh, so here's, here's the goal again of what we want to do. And well, what we're going to do is, uh, it's, it's actually not too complicated. We'll start by taking the rows of C and just permuting them so that row X is swapped with row X, X or A. And similarly, we're going to swap the columns. We'll swap row Y, column Y, with column Y, X, or B. Uh, so this isn't going to give us exactly what we want. But we have sort of randomly moved around to where, where the errors are. So now for all but epsilon fraction of the entries in our matrix C prime, we got by just permuting rows and columns, we have that the X, Y entry of C prime is minus one to the power of not the inner product of x and y, but the inner product of x, x, or a with y, x, or b, because these are the row and columns that are in this spot now. Uh, so the, we're, we're going to need to make some small corrections to turn this into what we actually want. But the, the key is this really nice, basically the fact that the inner product is, is, is mod 2 is bilinear. So uh, you can check that. The mod 2, the inner product of x, x, or a with y, x, or b, is equal to just the inner product of x with y plus the inner product of a with y plus the inner product of x with b plus the inner product of a with b. So what we're computing is minus 1 to the power of what we want, the inner product of x and y, plus some other terms. Uh, and the, the idea is that these other terms, well, we need to get rid of them. But none of them depends on both x and y at the same time. Each of our, our sort of error terms we need to get rid of depends only on the column we're dealing with or only on the row we're dealing with or, or on neither even. So what we're going to do is we're just going to cancel out these terms. So first, if we take every x such that the inner product with x and b is odd, and we multiply that row by minus 1, then we'll cancel out this inner product with x and b term for all the entries. And similarly, if we multiply every column y by minus 1 to the power of the inner product of a with y, then we'll cancel out this inner product of a with y and term from all the entries. And then finally, if the inner product of a and b is odd, then we'll just mu multiply the entire matrix by minus 1 to cancel out this last term. 
So by doing just these multiplying rows, columns, and the entire matrix by minus one, the, in, the result is that we've canceled out these terms we don't want. And we then have that C prime at x comma y is equal to the inner product mod two of x and y whenever the, the entry that we've permuted to here had no error in the first place, just like we wanted. And it's not so hard to check. C prime has the same rank as C. Since all we did was we took C, we permuted rows and columns, which doesn't change the rank, and we negated entire rows or columns or the entire matrix, which doesn't change the rank. Like row, multiplying an entire row by a constant doesn't change the rank. So since we only did operations which don't change the rank of the matrix, uh, our resulting matrix C prime has the same rank as C originally did, but we randomly spread out where the errors were. Uh, so yeah, the, are there any questions about that? <laughs> I, I think it's 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 a pretty simple proof. It's just if you see like the random self-reducibility of XOR or inner product mod two before, it's it's basically just explaining that fact. And Josh, can you connect this back to what you did in the first part? Um, yeah, yeah. So in our in our proof of, of the non-rigidity of of the Hadamard matrix, you know, we had this property that all the errors were in the rows and columns corresponding to vectors with about half ones and half zeros, like vectors in that set E we were talking about before. So it kind of seemed at the time like maybe those vectors, the ones with uh, about half ones and half zeros were kind of the hard ones. And for some reason, like errors had to, or it was easier to make the errors be in those rows and columns or something like this. But actually, this this proof shows if we apply that that construction to our proof from before, from upper bound from before, you can actually like randomly move the errors around to any rows and columns that you want to, and the and and we can still get the same the same rank and the same number of errors, but you can actually distribute them around anywhere you you, you want to. So there's there's no entries which are like harder than other entries. Yeah. OK, um, so uh, okay, so, so that's, that's the equivalence of rigidity and probabilistic rank. And then there's, I think, I, think I, have, I have about 10 minutes left. Is that right? OK, so in the last 10 minutes, I want to talk, tell you about one, one last notion that's related to rigidity and probabilistic rank, and it's called the well, sign rank of a matrix. So this will be interesting. I guess we're going to get a cool result, but I, I mostly want to show it to you because we're going to prove a few uh, different upper bounds for, for regular rigidity and regular probabilistic rank along the way, which I think are sort of just neat examples of the notions. So uh, we say that matrix B sign represents a matrix A, which is, well, let's say A is a minus one, one matrix now instead of a zero, one matrix like we were talking about before. Actually, inner product mod 2 is a minus 1, 1, 0 matrix also. Well, if A is a minus 1, 1 matrix, we'll say that B sign represents it if for every entry, the sign of that entry of B is equal to that entry of A. So whenever A is negative, B is negative. And whenever A is positive, B is positive. But B doesn't have to be a minus 1, 1 matrix anymore. Then the sign rank of A is the minimum rank of a matrix B, which sign represents the matrix. And there, there are some examples where the sign rank of a matrix can be substantially lower than its rank also. Uh, then we can similarly define the sign rank rigidity and the probabilistic sign rank. Like the, the sign rank rigidity is, you know, for a fixed rank R, if you can, you want to say like you can, you're, you're unable to change a small number of entries to drop the rank, the sign rank of the matrix below R. And the probabilistic sign rank is you want like a distribution on matrices which sign sign represent a except that a small epsilon number of the entries. The, the, the analogous notions for sign rank instead of regular rank. Uh, and you can check by our, that our theorem we just proved actually still holds for sign rank rigidity and probabilistic sign rank, since all we did was move around entries and negate entries. So you can see that sign rank rigidity and probabilistic sign rank are actually equivalent for the Hadamard matrix also. Uh, and what I want to prove to you about sign rank is, well, before we've been talking about how rigidity is connected to, to arithmetic circuit lower bounds, but I want to show you an example where you can actually connect rigidity with a type of rigidity with Boolean circuit lower bounds also. So what I'm going to show is that 
if you have a family of functions, which is the family of Boolean functions, which is sign rank rigid. So more precisely, say it's sign rank rigidity, rank R rigidity is this four to the n over say r to the 0.999, like something just slightly less than r. And remember, uh, the truth table matrix is a two to the n by two to the n matrix. This is like the dimension squared divided by r to the 0.99999. For some r that's just mildly exponential in n, then that would prove that the function requires exponential size threshold, like depth two threshold circuits. So uh, it doesn't matter exactly what a depth two threshold circuit is right now. I'll, I'll define it when I get to it. But these depth through threshold circuits are like a notoriously hard class to show exponential size lower bounds for. But this kind of rigidity result like this would show such a lower bound for them. And well, where's, what's interesting about this uh, for the end over R to the 0 0.999? Well, the Hadamard matrix is actually known to have sign rank rigidity for to the n over R. And it, it has rigidity that and it has sign rank rigidity that. So, Basically, what we're saying is if you could improve this just a tiny, tiny little bit just by an r to the point zero 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 one factor, then that would improve that would imply huge new boolean circuit lower bounds. Uh, I just want to say this is not this is not even like the first result that that connects rigidity to threshold circuit lower bounds. There's been previous work where they show that uh, regular rigidity would imply, weaker threshold circuit lower bounds, like bounds against th linear threshold of majority circuits, say. Uh, but here, by, by going from regular rank rigidity to sign rank rigidity, we're actually able to connect it to the harder linear threshold function of linear threshold function circuits. OK, so let, let, me, sh let me show you the proof. If the, 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 the details here are not so important, but uh, Basically, how, how I'm going to prove this theorem is I'm going to show that threshold of threshold circuits have small sign rank rigidity. Because if they have if these circuits have small sign rank rigidity, then any function which has high sign rank rigidity can't be computed by one of these circuits. Uh, and to do this, I'm going to build up a sequence of basically probabilistic rank upper bounds for increasingly complicated functions. And at the end, we'll use it to get a sign rank upper bound for threshold of threshold circuits. So that's the plan. I'm going to present you three different just probabilistic rank upper bounds, like the things we were talking about before. And then at the last step, we're going to use them to make a sign rank upper bound for threshold of threshold circuits. OK. So let me get started with, uh, I'll, I'll define what all these functions are when we get to them. So let me start with the equality function. So the eq sub n, the equality function, takes in two n bit vectors, and it's equal to one if they're equal to each other and zero otherwise. So in other words, the truth table matrix of this function is the identity matrix. And uh, as promised, I'm going to show you that it has epsilon probabilistic rank order one over epsilon. OK. And this, this, this works over any ring, even. Uh, so here's the idea. It's sort of. It's sort of motivated from uh, like a communication protocol for, for disjointness or for equality, if, if you've seen these things before. So what we're going to do is uh, let's set k to be log of 1 over epsilon. We're going to pick k random subsets of the indices of 1 through n. And then we're going to define using them k hash functions that take in a vector x and give a 0, 1 value. And these hash functions are going to be defined by h sub i is just going to be the parity of the Entries of x given by the set s, the randomly chosen set s sub i. So these are, these are hash functions that take in a vector and give a 0, 1 value. And what's interesting about them is that, well, of course, if x equals y, then h of x is going to equal h of y. But if x is not equal y, then we always have that h of x is not equal to h of i with probability 1 half. And why is that? Well, if you, if you think of, let's say, an entry uh, in a certain entry k, x was not equal to y, then by the principle of the, uh, k is not a good letter. If a certain, a certain entry i prime, say, x was not equal to y, then by the principle of deferred decisions, we can pretend that we're picking whether or not i prime is going to go into our set s last. And when we pick it, depending on which of the two choices we make, depending on whether we include that in our set or not, it'll change whether h of x equals h of y or not. 
So with probability 1 half, based on just that last decision, we'll have that h of x is not equal to h of y. So what we're then going to do is write one nice sort of polynomial in the h's, which, which sort of amplifies the probability of success with all of them together. So what we're going to do is compute sort of this expression, where uh, this term in parentheses here is, is, you can check it's equal to 1 if h of x equals h of y, but it's equal to 0 if h of x is not equal to h of y. So if we multiply it together for all the k different choices of the hash functions, we'll see that this is going to be 1 if definitely 1 if they're equal to each other, but it'll be 0 with probability at least 1 minus 2 to the minus k if x is not equal to y, because at least one of those things will be 0 in our product. Uh, so how do we get a rank expression from this? It's basically the same as what we were doing to get a rank expression from our polynomials before. So when you expand this out, since there's two terms and we multiply k of them together, we'll get a sum of 2 to the k terms. And each is of the form some function of x's times the function of y's. Like the function of x's will look like some h sub i's of x's and some 1 minus h sub i's of x's. And the function of y's will look like some h sub i of y's and some 1 minus h sub i of y's. So we'll get 2 to the k terms that look like this for some functions f and g. And just like we saw, each monomial was a rank 1 expression. We similarly get any term that looks like a function of x times a function of y is also a rank 1 expression, because you can just consider the, the vector of f of x evaluated all the x's and the vector of g of y evaluated all the y's and, and take their dot product will evaluate. We'll evaluate or it's their, sorry, their tensor product will give the rank one vector, which is this evaluated all the x's and y's. So since we have a sum of two to the k terms and each has rank one, we see that the rank is two to the k, which is indeed order one over epsilon, and the error is two to the minus k, which is less than or equal to epsilon. So this gives the probabilistic rank expression that we want. Uh, is that good so far? Yeah. yeah I'm just wondering, uh, why couldn't you just uh, take the matrix, the block, the diagonal matrix that has blocks filled with ones, uh, like one of the epsilon blocks on the diagonal filled with ones. Yeah. Um, that has the rank one of the epsilon. And if you just randomly permute rows and columns, you should get yeah. what you want, right? That's true. You can do that too. I think uh, that's that's basic. I think that's there's some yeah. sense in which that's equivalent to what yeah. we do, actually. Okay. Yeah. We It's like we randomly permute them so that uh, rows with the same hash values get the same thing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's 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 right. We can do that too. Okay, um, so from this bound for equality function, we're now going to get an upper rank probabilistic rank up around for the less than or equal to function. So this is now one if x is less than or equal to y instead of one if x equals y, and we're going to see this has probabilistic rank n squared over epsilon now. Um, and the idea is. We're basically just going to express the less than or equal to function in terms of the equal function. So if x is less than or equal to y, then either x equals y, so we compute that right here, or there's some bit i where x is 0 in that bit and y is 1 in that bit, and all the bits before were equal to each other. So there's like the first bit in which x differs from y. So we sum over which bit they differ in of making sure x is 0 in that bit, y is 1 in that bit, and they were equal in all the i minus 1 previous bits. So this sum I've written here computes the less than or equal to function in terms of the equal function. And then we're just going to replace each of the equals that appears here with an expression from the last slide. So if you replace each equals with an expression with error epsilon over n plus 1, then by the union bound, all n plus 1 of the equals will be correct with error only epsilon. So that gives us the error that we want. And each one, remember that rank was 1 over epsilon on the last slide. So each of these will have rank n over epsilon. And when we sum all n plus 1 of them together, we'll get probabilistic rank n squared over epsilon. So that's that's a, a pretty simple way to get from the equal function to the less than or equal to function. OK, then the last like slightly tricky one is we're now going to go from less than or equal to to a linear threshold function. So this is a function that takes in the x's and y's. And there's some coefficients, v's and w's and a t. And then it computes this linear this uh, linear form on the x's and y's and checks whether it's less than or equal to t or not. That's what a, that's what a linear threshold function is. And so the uh, less than or equal to is like a special case of a linear threshold function if our weights are all like the consecutive powers of two. 
But what we can see is actually any linear threshold function has the same probabilistic rank as just the less than or equal to function did. And I'll show by, by just reducing it to the regular less than or equal to function. Uh, so here's what you do. Um, let's say we define A and B to be functions where basically A evaluated at x is the, the x part of this linear form here, and B evaluated at y is t minus the y part of the linear form here. So in other words, f is now computing whether a of x is less than or equal to b of y. Uh, then, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take all these a and b values and sort them in a list. So let's say we let l be the list of all the values of a of x evaluated at all the x points, and all the values of b of y evaluated at all the y points. So there's 2 times 2 to the n values in our list l. And say we sort them in increasing order then what we're going to have our, our probabilistic rank expression do is not compute whether a is less than or equal to b, but we're going to compute whether the index of a in the list is less than or equal to the index of b in the list. So if we define the function alpha, which takes in an x value and returns the index of a of x in the sorted list l, and similarly beta takes in a y value and returns the index of b of y in the sorted list l, then just since f is computing whether a is less than or equal to b, we similarly have that f is computing whether a alpha of x is less than or equal to beta of y, whether a comes before b in this sorted list we constructed. And since alpha of x is just a function of the x's and beta of y is just a function of the y's, we see that this expression here has the exact same probabilistic rank as the less than or equal to function did originally. So since it had rank n squared over epsilon, so does any linear threshold function. OK. So I think that's a, I think that's a neat like sorting trick to reduce like any linear threshold function to a simpler less than or equal to function. Okay, and from here and from here we're basically done. So uh, linear th a depth two linear threshold function is just a function which is it now computes a sum with some weights and there's i different linear threshold functions f sub i, or sorry s different one. If, if it's a size s linear threshold function, then it sums from i equals 1 to s of some weight wi times some linear threshold function fi and checks whether that's bigger than or equal to some threshold t or not. OK, and what I'm going to show is that f has epsilon probabilistic sine rank s squared times n squared over epsilon. And, and this is actually very simple. We just, well, we know that f is the sine of this linear form minus t, because if, if that was bigger than or equal to t, it's 1 and minus 1 otherwise. Uh, and so if you just replace, oh, OK, if you just replace each fi with the probabilistic rank expression from before, which with error epsilon computed the correct 0, 1 value for the linear threshold function f sub i, uh, so if we just replace it with that probabilistic rank expression with error epsilon over s, then again, by the union bound, they'll all be correct with probability with error only epsilon. And so this whole expression will be correct. With probability with error only epsilon, so the sign of it will be correct with probability one minus epsilon. So if we just replace these s of i's with the probabilistic rank expression, we get a probabilistic sign rank expression for a linear threshold function of linear threshold functions. Uh, and that's it. That's 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 the whole construction. And then from here, you get the theorem that I talked about, and the, the idea is basically you you if you had this rigidity bound, you plug in r for the rank here and uh, this 1 over r to the 0.999 for the error here, and you would get a contradiction. So uh, this, this rank up, probabilistic sign rank upper bound for LTF of LTFs gives this, gives this uh, connection between rigidity and LTF and LTF circuits. Uh, yeah, uh, any questions about that? All right, so yeah, just to, just to conclude, I guess we, we we looked at rigidity in three settings. We saw the walsh hadamard transform is not rigid enough for a valiance program. Uh, we saw some equivalences between rigidity and probabilistic rank. And we just now I showed that better sign rank rigidity lower bounds would give exciting circuit lower bounds. So connection between rigidity and circuit lower, like Boolean circuit lower bounds in, in addition to arithmetic circuit lower bounds. So just uh, what do I think is next in this area? Well. 
I think it would be really neat to show that other families of matrices that people conjecture to be rigid are not actually rigid. Uh, they're, they're, uh, I think there are a bunch of nice candidates like Vandermond matrices, for instance, have a structure similar to uh, the Walsh Hadamard transform. So it'd be cool if you could extend this result to Vandermond matrices, for instance. Uh, another, another interesting idea would be, you know, even though even though we have this non-rigidity of Hadamard, we don't yet think that the Hadamard transform actually has small arithmetic circuits necessarily. And it'd be neat to find a stronger notion than rigidity, which which is still true for the Hadamard matrices and which would prove the, the lower bound. So like for instance, uh, Pavel Pudlak pointed out to me and Ryan recently that uh, if you if you modify Valiant's proof just a little bit, you can show that like not only if you like if you have a function which is not only rigid, but also in the rigidity expression, uh, the rows and columns of the matrices are required to be quite sparse. This would also so if you're just rigid with rigidity expressions which are very sparse, that would also imply some kinds of circuit lower bounds, probably maybe the exact same arithmetic circuit lower bounds. So it'd be cool to come up with stronger notions like this and study whether they still do or don't hold for the matrices we're interested in. And then last, I think it would be really cool to use probabilistic rank expressions like this to design faster algorithms. And I guess this is a big area of ongoing work. Yeah, uh, so I think that's all I have to say, thanks. Hey, thank you, Josh. Uh, any more questions? Uh, maybe just um, one quick question. Is the Hadamard believed to have a higher sign rank rigidity? You mentioned uh, oh. to the n over r, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the, yeah, for the n over r. Uh, I think it's believed to have a little bit higher rank. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not so sure. I think I think it's kind of it's kind of unclear. I mean, it was believed before recently it was believed to have like way higher probabilistic rank. So I, I think it, it's kind of hard to get intuition for how high it should be. Thanks. Any more questions? Um, so um, okay, wait a few more seconds. Uh, in the meantime, remind you that uh, we're not sure we'll have any talk in two weeks, but uh, after that we have Santos Vempala and Pastor uh, Green Larson. And um, we'll probably, let's go offline, uh, Clement, and uh, thank you everyone for attending. And uh, yeah, you're all welcome to stay and chat a bit here um, off the recording, okay. <laughs>